Troy, thanks for coming. How's it going, man? Yeah. Well, good, huh? Yeah. I I can tell that you're uh, you're doing good. That is that is an amazing sound. Woo! <laughs> yeah, man, that's awesome. Can I get in and sit next to you? Sure. All right. Now this is not one of the easier cars to get in and out of. No, not at all. There's a bit of a st step and slide. You can't rob a bank in this car. No. Oh. Wow. And as big as this car is, you can see if you look at the footwell there, I'm only 5'8", and this is this is all the space you've got. But it holds you in. That's what it's it, supposed to be. It needs to hold you in. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, Turn it off, man. That thing's awesome. Tell me, what is you know? So this is the twin turbo version of the correct S7. What's the motive? It's back there. It's a 428 twin turbo Ford. You know, basically, <laughs> like they put in the Cobra jets, the old ones. You know, stroke seven liter. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty good engine. And that's about 750 horsepower. Yeah, the manufacturer says 757. You know, all they always vary a little, but it's about 250 horsepower more than just the aspirated one, the regular one. And having ridden in this thing with you, I I understand how that power gets to the to the road through the rear wheels only. Yeah. No assists. ABS? No ABS, no yep. traction control. Pure As a matter of fact, no airbags. No airbags. This is and, and this is a car you put throw a livery on this car and you could take it to Le Mans. Oh yeah. I mean that's yeah. really the difference between the race car and the street car is a livery and probably some stripping down of the interior, I imagine. Uh, this car basically was designed to get in your garage, put your helmet over the drive, drive to the track, spend all day on the track, get back and drive it back to the garage. That's what it was. Yeah. You know, it's a barely street legal race car. And you don't use the stereo much, I imagine. No, I don't. I mean, the stereo's behind me. Yeah, that is a rumbling, bass-ridden yeah. pile of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so why don't you sh shoot on in here? I mean, the doors, these are scissor doors? Yeah, What's kind of a scissor door, scissor? you know, like gold wing scissor, different kinds, you know, I mean, the way they come up and down, but I would call these more the gold wing. Scissor doors yeah. are more on the Lambos that I have, but, you know, when they come down like this, you know, but they're pretty lightweight because the whole car's carbon fiber. I mean, you know, it's nothing to take them in and out. But again, you're not going to be robbing any banks to get in and out of this. Can't thing. get in and out of this thing easy or gracefully, I don't think. Once you do get out, get in it though, you're gone. Yeah, I mean, you could sit in this car for 10, 12 hours. You know, a lot of people wonder how they can do these races. You know, like the 24 hours of Le Mans and stuff that they're in. Well, actually, once you're in this, I mean, you're so secure. It's it is very comfortable once you're in there. Yeah. You know, and that's all it's designed. I mean, when you're racing on the track, you don't get in and out three times. You know, so. This is what this is designed for. Holds you in. It's great. Let's. Uh, we can climb our way out of it, and then we'll show how that the driver's seat over there is offset. Correct. Uh, from this, you can take a look here. Shoot this this distance here. Take a look at that, and that's what about four or five inches. And then we'll compare it to the other side. One of the really unique things about this chassis that just keeps the driver perfectly focused and it distributes the weight optimally right um, you're actually centered here with the car you're not centered on everything else but it's, it's you're in the perfect position for the car yeah man just sitting in one of these very few people get to do this and uh it's an experience i'm soaking it in right now yeah, all right let's uh let's as gracefully as possible find our way out of the car grab my leg here i mean you really slide in and out and and down to get in and out of that as you can see that was not graceful uh no no graceful way to get in and out of there but let's come around the front and then show that comparison shot of the difference in the uh in the spacing between the seats and the sides and this is one of 22. there's only 22 twin turbos approximately almost 90 of the cars built period in this livery but only 22 of them were the twin turbo and two of those of those cars built were the 1000 horsepower race version okay and this is one of one in this color yep one of one in this color combination most of them have the tan this has the gray you know so there are really no options they're only one way what and what's the name of the color it's called liz not lip but liz stick red that was named after steve saline's wife who's liz and she picked this color 
great color, so they named the color after her. That's that's a awesome contribution to you know have a family contribution yeah. get get her name in there and obviously she has great taste. Oh yeah, it's so that's beautiful. That's been signed by Steve Saline, so that's kind of nice. Oh, uh, you want to get a shot of that? There's a Steve Saline signature right on the bottom of the door there. And with these kind of doors, that's the best place to sign. Yep. Right at eye level. There's just so many lines to it. It's so much car, yeah. in size, in power. In proportion, if you look well, right down. Well, it's so unique because it is like, you know, basically a race car. As you can see all the bolts here, that's so the panels come off, you know. I mean, it's not like a regular car old trunks. I mean, if you want to service the vehicle, that's what you have to do. These bolts come and the panels come out, just like taking pieces off at a race car at the track, you know, take the back cap off, the front cap off, and that's really how this car works. Yeah, and if you look really closely, I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but you can actually see the carbon fiber underneath the, the paint, paint. Yeah. Um, and you could you could call it an imperfection, but it's actually it just is. a really cool yeah. thing that kind of shows somebody who knows this is a carbon well, fiber. 2004, 2005 with these cars, I mean, carbon fiber was just starting to come into where it was. I mean, now it's all everywhere, so it's a lot of different weaves and stuff. But also the center lock wheels, you know, those are raced, you know, it's a center lock wheel. It's mm -hmm. not like a lug nut for your regular car, you know, and... It doesn't have carbon fiber ceramic brakes back then. Just had a huge steel brakes with gigantic calipers. The know. entire wheel wheel well is, is filled with brakes. Yeah, filled with brakes. And in 2005, the technology of traction control and stability assist and interlock brakes and airbags, those were all available. They were available. Just not something that goes with this car. Yeah, I think that I think Steve Saline and the Saline, you know, speaking for him. Their whole theory was they wanted to reproduce the winning numbers they had with their cars onto this. Okay. You know? Let's uh, let's come around this way, take a, a look at the back. Can you pop the, uh, the glass hatch sure. and we'll take a look at the engine. And then shortly after this, we're, after we kind of get our up close and personal look at the car here, we're going to debut episode six of Along for the Ride. Awesome video produced by eGarage starring Roy and myself, well, co-starring with the car. The car is obviously the star in every way here. So much intake. There's just so much going on there. It's, it's a huge engine bay. I mean, that's there's more space taken up by the motor than there is for the for the passenger yeah. and driver. So they can work on. It. I mean, the motor's the heart of the car. Without this motor, you have no car. You know, and did the use of carbon fiber everywhere, you know, it's just amazing, you know. And you got the gigantic air vents over here that, you know, suck the air in. It's just Carbon fiber crazy. intakes going up, going from the from the intake up there down yeah. to the turbos. But if you look on this side, you see the air intake for cooling. I mean, look how large that is to suck air in and bring just to cool the motor area, you know, down there. You know, it's just crazy. That big spot right there, yeah, that's awesome. And what if I remember from riding in it, and that was in almost fall weather, the heat of that motor, it transfers oh, right yeah. into the cabin too. Yeah, you can feel it. But yeah, it does have air conditioning. It does have air conditioning. I've never used it. You know, I just windows down. But then again, I've never driven in really hot weather either. You know. Can we pop pop the the hatch I'm, there? I'm, uh, that's just for the trunk. That's we'll just the trunk. This is where, if you're going to take a car like this on a road trip, and I doubt many people that own these cars probably take them on many road trips. Yeah, see this one you have to pop down, so it's, you have to push down. I don't think it'll go down. I just want to, here, we'll hold it while I'm doing it, because okay. again, the car's off balance a little, so it's, there, there we go. go. I'll let you open that. Yep, so there's where you put your, your, your two small bags. Yes. Your carry-on luggage. That's my battery charger for when it's there. Yeah, yeah. The best thing is to FedEx your luggage ahead of time. That's yeah, exactly. Take clothes you'd ever want back and throw it away. When what? Do you know how big, about how big the tank is, or how far do you think you could get on on a tank? Of you gas? know, it's a it's about fourteen gallon tank right now, and depending on how your foot's in and out of it, I can probably make it from two hundred miles or less. Okay, so know? it's it it is feasible enough that you could take it on a road oh, yeah. trip. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Although yeah. not really meant to be a road trip car. No, no. And you do have the front trunk. You've got some more space in the front, too. Hmm, take a look at that, too. This is the exploded view. This is for the Forza Vista portion of the show, IRL. So you could get another 
Another bag where you well, can fold your is, suit no, over is, in there. This was designed specifically for one reason, one reason only. When you go to your friend's wedding to put the tux there. Yep, that's what, fold that's it fold it over, fold the tux, and that's it. You know? <laughs> so, but uh, that's about all you can put in there. So it does have a couple little spaces, you know. Yeah, it keeps it functional. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, uh, there's your up close and personal look at Sailing S7 Twin Turbo. Let's take a look at the video that Roy and I were in driving around Seattle um, that eGarage made and then we'll come back and we'll talk with Roy and we'll talk with Ben about the production of the video and get a lot more details about this car. So let's go ahead and roll the video. Here with Roy Katz. Nice to see Katz you. Katz Exotics. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Sure. All these cars. This is such an amazing place to be. Such an amazing collection. I mean, you've been a Lamborghini guy. Lamborghini forever. guy, true and true. Currently own about 12 Lamborghinis of my own. I probably had at least 150 to 175 Lamborghinis go through my hands. How does the Saline S7 Twin Turbo stand up against? Uh, Lamborghini or other Italian cars? Well, this is American car. Yeah. So it's pure muscle, American muscle, 427, pumping out 850 horsepower. You know, no ABS, you know, no computer aided stuff. If you took the badges off it and asked people, most people would think it comes from Italy by its design. Right. But the design is really a functional design because this car was designed that you could drive it to the track, race, and drive it home. That's what it was designed for. What's your favorite thing about this car since you've owned it? Uh, that the tires spin in every gear. <laughs> so we're going to take this thing out for a drive? Yeah, we can take it out for a drive. You're not driving. <sighs> no. Well, I, will, I will be pleasured by just sitting in the passenger seat and hearing that muscle roar. <laughs> supercars, if you think you know supercars, you still may not have heard of, of Saline S7. This car just kind of stands alone as, I would call it, one of the kings. Definitely. It stands out with the lines. There's no other supercar with lines that are quite as long, wide, dramatic. Brand new, this car was 604,000 and some change. But for me, you know, it, it's not about the money on the car because I can't replace it. So I don't buy it because it's expensive. Yeah. I buy it because I like the car. So you're the steward of the car. Yeah, if you're gonna buy a car thinking it's gonna go up in value, forget it. You're just renting time and space. So what have you done with the car while you've owned it? Driven. You've driven it? Oh yeah. It, it got up here to me about, about April. And I put more miles on it in six months than he did in 13 years. It's not a car you can rob a bank in because you can't get in and out fast. <laughs> but uh, once you're in here and you're sitting, you're just wrapped and it's just a pleasure to be in. Driven a lot of very, very desirable cars. Does this one get a different reaction when you're driving out there? I mean, do people say, what is that thing? Without a doubt of all the cars I've owned, this car has always attracted way more attention than any other car I've ever had. The first thing everybody says, what is it, a Ferrari? You know, that's the most common I hear. Right. No, they're intrigued that, wow, a car like this is made in the US. And then when you tell them, yeah, and it was built in 2005, they floor themselves even more. 13 years old. 13 but it, years old looks like something just came off the drawing board. It's a timeless design. And this came with a backup camera. Yes, it did. Yeah, from 05. I know, it's really weird. Well, the first one. When you look in the rear view mirror, all you're seeing is that huge intake and those beautiful pipes and that massive V8 back there. Yeah, but you know what they say if you're driving a car like this, what's behind you doesn't matter. Driving around Seattle in this car with you, Roy, was one of the very special experiences of my life. We had a beautiful day for it. We saw some of the classic Seattle sights. People were just astounded. That clip going through uh, Pike Place Market there. That was fun. I think we both were just like, 
yeah, people were looking at us like, who are these people? What is that? Yeah. <laughs> it was super fun. Uh, but let's go back um, and find out, you know, where did, when did you first learn about the S7 and the TT itself? The twin turbo. Saline S7 back in 2004 when it first came out. That's when I first heard about the car and wanted the car. And did you follow the development of it before that? Not really. It was a car that came up and all of a sudden just, you know, like most an impulse buy, I wanted the car and I knew where it was going to be and started from there. But that car, you didn't buy one back in 2005. You waited quite a while and I think you had your eye on this one. Right. Um, tell me about what you knew about this car as it led up to the well, purchase of it. At that time, Ron Tonkin Ferrari was the dealer for Saline, and they were in Portland. And I bought some cars from them, and I knew their manager. And this particular car, this exact car, was coming to them. It was one of the first cars with twin turbo done. And I called them and said I wanted to come down and see it on a Saturday. By the time I got down there, they had sold it. And it was like, oh, really? And after hemming and hawing a lot, they were nice enough to give me the new owner's information. Okay. And uh, the car left and went to Hawaii. And I literally, on the anniversary for years, every day would call the owner and say, would you like to sell it to me? Would you like to sell it? And continuously said, no, 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 until early 2018 when he called me. So some 13 years, you pastored him. Yeah. And uh, he knew that if he was going to sell it, it was going to go he to He told you. me he always would. You know, I think the thing that amazed me when he did call me because he was trying to develop more his business and he needed some money for his business. When I asked him, well, how many miles does he have on it now? I expected some money. And when he responded with under 700 miles, I thought I was going to die. You know, no miles on the car. Nearly new. Brand new. And then how many have you put on it since then? I think we talked about that in the video, but you've driven it. 10 times as much as he has in the I time put more miles it. on that car in the first five months than he put in all 13 years. I bet the car appreciates it, too. Oh, yeah. Runs better. <laughs> now, the success that the Saline had with this in racing, was that important to you in the, in the purchase of it, or was it all about just this American supercar concept? Well, Saline has pretty good history. I mean, Steve Saline himself has won, you know, seven champions. If you look back, Saline itself has had more championship wins than McLaren. You know, a lot of people don't realize that. So, yeah, that was important for the, the design of the vehicle if you wanted to race it and stuff. And it was important that it was American ingenuity. Was Did say, did Steve Saline sign that before you owned it, or is that something that happened during your ownership? During my ownership, uh, one, of, one of the deals when I flew it back from Hawaii, since it only had such low miles on it and hadn't been seen by the dealer for a while, I sent it back to Saline and Corona so they could go through the entire car before it came up to Seattle. So they went through it all, tires, service, you name it, everything, and I flew down. I, I've known Steve for a while. I've met him before on some rallies, and he was nice enough to go ahead and sign it for me and do that, and we went for a drive, him and I together, and fun. Now, there's kind of an interesting part of the delivery process. When you take ownership of an S7, it has to go through one particular uh, change to fit the new owner. Tell yes. me about that. Well, the seats are fixed. You know, they don't, there's not a, a, an assembly that you can go back and forth. First of all, they're not electric, they're manual, but they are bolted to the ground. So you have to be fitted for the seat and also have to be fitted for the steering wheel exactly where it is and stuff like that. So that's one of the part of the things I did when I flew down to the factory to get it refit to me. And what did, did, did the previous owner in Hawaii, what did he really do with it? Obviously, it mostly sat. Um, yeah. did, was it just something in his collection that he appreciated? What else do you know about it, what he did with it? You know, I know he didn't have a lot of cars in his collection. I mean, this was his, and he did. He didn't drive very many of his cars. I, I don't know if there's very many places to drive a car like this or any car in Hawaii to begin with. Uh, you know, the, as a matter of fact, the only picture I ever had was he sent me a picture. I was trying to get it into his garage, but it was so low they had to put planks on to try and get it up over the garage. So that's the only picture he ever sent me. Um, I think a big portion of its life it sat in a showroom of an exotic car dealer they were attracting attention. Okay. And it, it certainly does that yes. very, very well. Um, now, this is kind of a unique part of your collection um, because aside from running Cats Exotics, where you have amazing cars everywhere, you've been a collector yourself over the years. Talk about the, the difference between the Saline S7 and the Lamborghinis that have really been your passion. Well, both of them have the uniqueness of low production, you know, at least up through 2001 for Lamborghini, 2005 for the Saline. Um, they're both un totally unique, different cars. I mean, for the most part, you know, Lamborghinis, the ones I like are the V12s, big muscle in there. And this is a muscle car, too. I like that. But it's American sound, American difference, where it's European sound, European difference. It, uh, really not comparison of cars. 
as far as their handling, stiffness, are they similar in, in any way? Well, this car is a rear-wheel drive only with no assist whatsoever. Where most of the Lamborghinis are pretty much all-wheel drive, you know, 60 the rear, 40 the front. Newer ones are 90, 10. Um, so you have a totally different handling perspective for that, yes. When driving the S7, what is, what's one of the distinctive features of driving the S7? Probably that you don't move one inch in the car. You know, I mean, it's fast and whatever, you go back and don't move in. The, the sound is unbelievable. I mean, the sound, people attract from blocks away looking and what's coming, what's coming. Yeah, I was able to tell when, when you showed up, um, there was this, we were in the middle of Wheel and Pedal Wednesday show, and I hear this rumble that I was like, I don't think that's Ben. That's got to be Roy, and it must be the S7 because the weather almost didn't cooperate today. Yeah. Um, so we're very thankful that the weather did cooperate and you're able to bring it here. To yeah, it was a fun drive show. down, 40 by down, but it was fun. And just, it's just a unique car because you can't re reproduce the sound of an American muscle car. Now, we talked about a little bit in the video that most people, when they see this car, they're, they have no idea what it is. Yeah. Even if you think you know supercars, you might come up to this and be like, is that a kit car? What is that? How would you gauge the, the public's reaction when they see this car? You know, it... it I get two of the most kind of reactions I get. The number one reaction I get is, wow, is this a new Ferrari model? No, it's not a Ferrari, you know? And the other reaction I get is, is this car out? Yes, yeah, it's a prototype, you know, because of its design and look. So I get that quite a bit. It's amazing that now it's, it's 14 years old. 14 years old. And the design still creates that reaction that it looks like something that's fresh out of the wind tunnel. Yeah, and you know, Saline Corporation, Steve Saline, right now they're making seven, what they call the 777 cars with 1,000 horsepower or 1,250 horsepower. And they, a little bit, 1.2 million and above, they've sold six. I think they have one available left that's on the production line right now. And it's literally the same identical car for looks other than technology has changed. But same body style, same everything. But they're all painted in one color. What do you think about that? That It's kind of a horsepower race. It seems like every year the, the new Ferrari or the new Lamborghini or the new McLaren, there's, there's always, they're always adding more power. My perception, and I don't drive them on a regular basis, is that at a certain point, it's just a statement. Um, but how, would you say that there's a range where once you're over 750 horsepower or whatever, that it's just a number? Well, it gets to the point of tenths of a second. You know, okay, I can do zero to 60 now in 2.3 instead of 2.4. Um, so, yeah, a lot of it is bragging rights. I think a lot of it, though, for the manufacturer to build for is the technology ability to make that they can do this. You know, bragging rights, I can do this out of this motor, you know. But, yeah, you're right, especially, for instance, in Seattle, there's really no place I could ever use 1,250 horsepower, you know, maybe for 500 feet, you know, on my way to jail, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, or the hospital. Yeah. but it was designed, you know, some of the new cars, a lot of the new cars now, the P1s, the Senna's, you know, all the pinnacle cars are specifically designed to really take to the track, get in your garage, put your helmet on the seat, drive to your local track, track it all day, get out and drive home. That's what they're really getting to do now. And that's what, unfortunately, most of the people buy it never see a track car, you know. Now, Lamborghini has always been your standard what was the first Lamborghini that you bought, and what was the draw to that car? I bought a 2001 Lamborghini Diablo 60 Special Edition. I bought it in September of 2001 from now defunct uh, Lamborghini dealership in Provo, Utah, uh, by Salt Lake City. Okay, you know, and they're they're gone now. And that was my very first car I ever bought. Um, I was drawn to that, you know, kind of like the Ferrucci Lamborghini and Enzo story. I had a lot of issues with my Ferraris, and I finally had one that was bought back under, you know, just had problems. And I had a friend of mine said, why don't you try a Lamborghini? And I said, I thought they were illegal in the United States. <laughs> and, uh, you know, now I think there's 26 or 28 dealers in the U.S., but back then there was four, you know. Okay. So that's what drew me, and I saw the car online, flew down, bought the car. Did you drive it back, or was oh, it yeah. towed? Yeah, yeah. Tell yeah, me that's a kind of a funny story, drive. too. So we... Me and my buddy flew down, and the dealership picked us up at the airport in Salt Lake City. We go to the car and looked it over and said, yeah, okay, this is the car I want. We agreed on the price, did the paperwork, and I says, okay, well, we'll have the wire here within an hour. I'm going to go have lunch with my buddy. He says, okay, so we'll go back to lunch and come back. He goes, yep, the wire arrived and everything. And I says, okay, well, do you guys put a temporary plate on it? He goes, what do you mean? Where, where's your truck? When do you want me to schedule the truck? <laughs> I said, there's no truck. I'm driving it home. And he said, that's over 1,800 miles. I said, yeah. 
people don't do that. I go, are you telling me this half million dollar car won't make it? I shouldn't have bought it. Does I get a <laughs> refund? It won't make it. Brand new car. He goes, well, I've just never heard of that. People just don't drive a car 1,800 miles. Exhaust. I go, well, I do. And today, as a matter of fact, this last weekend, I had it out for my birthday. And uh, it's, it's clothing in on 50,000 miles. And it's still one of the best driving cars I've ever had. That's amazing. That, and that really is high mileage. It, for, it's for considered Atlanta. high mileage. Have you had to service it more given that? Or does the car <laughs> tend to run even better the more it's driven? Um, my, all my experience in vehicles are, you know, they call what they call garage queens that sit. You know, my cars are not garage queens. My cars perform better than half the garage queens. Guys leave them there for all winter, and then real quick they want to drive on spring. Something's drying out. It's leaking. It's this. The, it's a machine. It's designed to be exercised. You know, mm. it's like a human body. You've never run or move your legs. You're going to have bad knees in the days. You know, use it or lose it is what it is. Right. And uh, I always, I have a funny analogy. People always say, "Oh my gosh, this car's got fifty thousand miles on it." I go, "Yeah." And your nineteen thousand dollar Toyota Prius has one hundred sixty thousand miles on it. Why can't this two hundred fifty thousand dollar Diablo do that too? It's, there's no reason why I can't. They're built. Technology is great. And so you still have that car. You still oh, have yeah. your first Lamborghini. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. And so that car, that's a that's your forever car. That's definitely one of my key kept cars. It'll never go anywhere. Now, since then, how many Lamborghinis have you owned in in in, your, in and out of your collection versus cars that have come through Cats Exotics? Um, you know, pretty much every Lamborghini that has gone into my collection, I've kept. Um, I, you know, I can only think of one Lamborghini off the top of my head that I bought in my collection. I sold, and the only reason I did that was because it was a duplicate one. I had two of them, and I thought, okay, share with somebody else. I really don't need it, so I sold it. And what it, was that car? That was a 2010 Lamborghini LP674 Super Veloce, and it was a six-speed in pearl white. And there was only three white six-speeds ever made for the U.S. I had ordered two of the three. And uh, I always I had the second one because I had this fear that my, my one would get total direct and I could never get a one. It's the very last six speeds ever made by Lamborghini. That's passion right there. Yeah, and finally <laughs> after a while, it only had 600 miles on it. And when my, my original one that I keep, that I still have now, started closing down 30,000 miles. I'm like, you know, this is unfair to let it sit here and rot. I'm gonna sell it and I sold it to a gentleman in San Francisco. Okay, what, when a, when a new Lamborghini comes along or, or an older one, what drives you to say, this is a car that I wanna have in my collection? Uh, Number one, production numbers, how many are made and produced, you know, it's one of those. And the rarity of the car, you know, as far as the so-called one of one, like the colors, combinations, uh, things like that. But the, the rare of the production of the car to me is the key. Now, most of us rarely ever get to even sit in one of these. We might see one at a car show. Uh, but you drive these amazing cars on a daily basis. Do you still have that same sense of appreciation every time you get into a car like this that you're driving it? What's that like to, to a certain degree, you must take, take it for granted because you have them and you've had them, but how does it feel to be able to just get in those cars and drive them all the time? Well, you know, it's funny because Seattle, we get snow in our winter here, and most people would know that performance tires are of no value under 42 degrees. My white SV, and there's pictures all over the internet, I've driven that in the snow, but I put snow tires on it October 1st and I take them off May 1st, and I drive that every year as my daily driver in the snow, I've driven it through Oregon, through Arizona, you name it, with snow, and that's what it's designed. I don't think I've ever become complacent that, oh, it's just a car, but to me, and some people understand, it really is just a car, it's not a god. You know, it's a machine. Knock on wood, I've been lucky in my life that I can afford them, and they are, and I appreciate them, but I do want to use it for what it was designed to be used for, and that's to be driven and enjoyed, not to be looked at. If I want to look at it, I'll buy a picture and hang it on the wall. <laughs> But you, they still make you smile every oh, time every that you time. get in. Every time. I mean, you know, probably more so now than it used to be because as my collection grows, I have less time with each car. So there may be a duration of time between driving it and driving it again, you know, maybe a month or two. And I go, wow, I still love this car. When you're going on a drive or going to do something, what makes you choose this one over, over that one? Is it a last minute whim or is, how does that process work in your brain? You know, it's for me that a lot of times it depends on the event. Um, you know, I'm a member of the Northwest Pacific Ferrari Club. You know, so if it's a Ferrari event, I'll make sure I take my Lamborghini. You know, it's usually <laughs> the only one there. You know, that's got to happen. So, and I usually, 
to be quite frank, I usually take one of my older Lamborghinis because it can still whip the new ones like crazy. And then like, oh, God, my car's 15 years old and you just paid 500000 for the brand new one. You can't keep up with me. I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> so that's one of them. Privately, if I go for a, a weekend or self myself, it would be just, you know, what roads I'm going and what I'm going to use. Because, you know, it's, I mean, I do keep it to 55. Well, maybe 155, but anyway, so, you know. <laughs> are most of your cars manuals? Do you have any yes. that are uh, that are paddle shifted? Most all my cars are manual. I'm, that's, you know, but nowadays you can't get you know, Some of my new cars that I've started getting in my collection are flip cars, what I call them flip cars with paddle cars. Yeah. And then are there other brands that have worked your, your way into your collection as well or something that you, other cars that you really appreciate? Yeah, recently in the last couple of years, the McLaren is just, unbelievable machine you know i was 675 lt it's a one of one in a blue it's uh that car is incredible i recently i'm sure some people know bought the senna at barrett jackson auction um the you know car number five that's a one of one and so the senna is just amazing machine the mclarens have, have just gone hand over fist on them they're a phenomenal car and that's amazing because i was at barrett jackson we did a video there and we definitely got some shots of your senna um, during that video, and it was something that we talked about during the video. So it's yeah. a pretty amazing circle of events that now you al and you almost brought that here today yes. because it was going to rain. Right. And the Senna is a good rain car. Well, it is. You know, it's got better <laughs> tires, but it was. It's kind of funny because of Barrett Jackson. I, I hadn't planned on buying the car. As a matter of fact, it really wasn't advertised. It was kind of a last minute entry, and I walked by and I saw it. and I said, "I'm buying this car." And uh, I'm glad I did. I can tell you the Senna is probably the only car in my life I've ever been in from all the ones I have that actually gives me G-force and puts you back. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah. What was that bidding process like? Uh, you, have you bought cars at Bear Jackson oh, before? Oh, yeah. I've been going for 20-plus years, multiple auctions. You know, the, the thing, the key to that is having, a, having an amount in your mind you're not going over. Because once you start going over that amount, you're losing your own sanity you know so right. i mean i had an amount in my mind that i would go to because i knew at that amount i could probably find another one from a private party and wouldn't have to pay extra because you didn't need to have that one right. exactly yeah. but at, there's also a mental process where you're kind of like i want that car yeah. and you know buying that set i mean a little off target here but when i went paid for it at barry jackson on sunday they had to pull it out of the out of the showroom or the big tent uh -huh. and the guy says okay where's your truck at where do you want to take it almost like my diablo and i says I'm driving it. And he goes, what? I go, I'm driving it. Where's the nearest gas station? Because it needed gas. <laughs> and the guy couldn't believe me. He goes, nobody drives these cars away. I go, well, I do. You know, so. And so you drove it home. I drove it home. From Arizona. From Arizona. The first time. First time. It was great. Did that harken back to that first experience that you had in the uh, Lamborghini? I mentioned you've been on many yeah. road trips, but that purchase and taking it home and the whole experience kind of resonates. Yeah, the biggest difference with the Senna was I got stopped a lot more by California Highway Patrols, Oregon, everybody, because nobody knew what it was. Huh. Everybody wanted to see that car, you know, so it was, it, was a, it was amazing. Had no trunk, so, you know, I had the same socks on for a week. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it, it was a fun, fun machine, still fun machine. So police do actually pull you over to say, I just pulled you over so I could look at your car. Oh, yeah. You know, they're doing, hey, do you mind if I get a picture? You know, cool. And, you know, and then, they're, I mean, they're pretty good about it. They'll say, hey, from here to mile pulse 26, you're okay. You know, and I go, oh, thanks, cool, you know. Now, is that, is the Senna, has that made it onto the never sell list or is it going to be market based? You know, I, I base my, I, a lot of people ask me that, you know, one, one of the common questions I always ask myself, I go, somebody came into my warehouse in the middle of the night, put a gun to my head and said, we're going to take every single car here but one. We're going to leave you one. Which one do you want? We won't kill you. I, I look at every car and try to decide that. When I don't have that passion for that car anymore, that's time to let it go out of my collection. And like I said, there's only really been once. The saline may be the next one to go. Okay. You know, so. And then what kind of sales process? Will that go through... Your business, will, would it go up for auction? Oh, how does that process work? You know, um, Is it different I, every time? Yeah, no, not really. A, a car like this, this kind of car, so unique, is, is for me better off at an auction site. You know, So considering probably Monterey this year, I might go there. You know, And I've had people, I've had my fun with it. It's, it was on my bucket list. It's a car I chased for 13 years. Um, but to be frank with you, you know, it's, it's, it's a great car, but... I don't get to the passion of it as much every day with my other cars. And when that happens, it's only fair to let the car go to the next person. That's a, that's a really great process, you know, that you're, you're willing to share. Yes. Yeah. Um, and when the car has had its time, it has its time.
Yeah, I don't, I don't ever want to have something rot in my garage when somebody else can enjoy it. That's just, it's not right. So if you're looking for a Saline S7 twin turbo, huh. I'm sure a lot of our Forza fans are, um, you can probably get, get, get a look at that thing online here coming up pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, which leads us to, you know, you run Cats Exotics, yes. awesome exotic car dealer in Linwood, Washington. Why did you start that car dealership? Because you had already had success in your business previously. What made you start Cats Exotics? Uh, yeah, the state of Washington, because I, I own a fired security alarm company. That's my main business. That's where I made my most. And um, one day we got aud audited by the Department of Revenue, and everything was fine, but they said you buy and sell more than 10 cars a year because I buy my vans for my company entitled, so you need a dealer's license. I'm like, why do I want a dealer's license? Okay. The best thing the state ever did to me, you know? So <laughs> dealer license and that I got a couple of my cars, and then friends started asking, hey, you can go to an auction because you could only go to some auctions as a dealer. Right. Started getting a lot of networking and stuff. And uh, it was a hobby that turned into a business. I never expected it to go where it was, you know. But it is the old saying, you know, do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. And how long has Cats Exotics been in existence now? Uh, we, uh, we got our license in 05, but we opened our actual doors to the public and started really selling the public in, in July of 08. Okay. And when a customer comes to Cats Exotics, what can they expect? I mean, this is a, a special vehicle for them. What kind of services is you're going to offer that they can't just go to a dealer or buy from eBay or something like that? Well, number one, there's no test drives. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's kind of <laughs> funny. Yeah, we get people, yeah, I saw this online. I'd like to test drive it. Yeah, well, of that's course not, you would. <laughs> I can you test drive it all you want after you buy it. You know, and then you can test drive it all you want. So we don't do test drives. And, you know, to be quite frank, our buyers don't need test drives. They know what they want. I'd say 90% of our buyers are online or out of state anyways, very few in state. Okay. Um, they're looking for specific. You have to remember the cars we carry, there's not something like you could go buy at every Toyota dealership. You know, I mean, if you go online right now, my cars, probably almost every car I have is either one of two or three in the country and that's it. So they're very boutique and unique vehicles. Like so that. your showroom reflects your tastes of not just buying the most common 458 out there, you're Correct. going to buy the one that's specially equipped to be one of Special few. color, you know, I mean, a lot of times I have, you know, uh, my son helps me, he's in the business, so are salespeople. A lot of times we buy vehicles that maybe have a color that isn't a popular color, but it is with somebody. And mm -hmm. I just need that one somebody to come in, you know. And that's like me, I may buy some vehicles once in a while that got a different color or a different uniqueness. It's a one-off. And the old saying is, well, there's a reason it's a one-of-one. One. Well but I'm the one of one that wants it. Right, do you find that that's why people come, come to you because you're, you're known for having the only purple Lamborghini right. that was out there? I would, yeah, definitely. I mean, we have people say, you know, like the newer Ventadors now, you might an Aventador everywhere, and I love the Aventador, but the ones we've carried or got, it's a one of one. I was looking for that specific color, that particular livery, you know, or that Roadster, or that S. So yeah, we have very rare vehicles. What's the rarest car that you've sold out of the showroom? Uh, I sold the Lamborghini LMO2 Cheetah, which was the prototype for Lamborghini. There was one of one. It was thought to have been destroyed, but we located it on a farm in Michigan. And uh, it took three years to totally rebuild it and put it back together. And it sold to a Swiss collector, probably the largest Lamborghini collector in the world in Switzerland for a pretty penny. Very nice. That's in, in, in Michigan. Yes. Yeah. That seems just like a, a totally out of place place to find a Lamborghini. Yeah, when I first got one. called on it by the guy, I thought this can't be real, but it turned out serial numbers and everything it was. Now the, the car market these days for some cars, manual cars, manual Lamborghinis in particular, it's changed. Yes. Tell me about how the market has changed in the last few years from the way it used to be. Well, I think for one, production numbers are way up, of course. Whether it be Lamborghini, Ferrari, Porsche, whatever. I mean, you got to consider, just use the Lamborghini example, you know, 2001 before they moved on, their last production year in 2001, they were talking making 300 cars worldwide. You know, now with the Aventador and the Huracan, they're talking making, you know, seven, 9,000 units a year. So that's one. Um, the, the companies that, you know, pretty much Volkswagen owns everything has gotten to the point that they can make a car pretty much affordable to anybody in the world, whether they lease it to you or whatever. So a lot of motor vehicles now, to me, I call them throwaway cars. You know, they just buy them, they, the best for the year, and they get rid of it, you know. 
On average, do your customers keep their cars for a long time, or do they tend to progress where they, they maybe bought the first car they could afford, and they'll come back a couple of years later to get the next model up, or do you have a lot of return customers in that? We way? have a lot of return customers to buy another, but not to turn theirs in. I mean, you know, again, we have some unique vehicles that once you buy it, you want to keep it in your collection. You really don't get rid of it a lot, you know. So, but we also have the buyers that are just buying. I mean, you know, we do carry the Hurcons and the Ventors and Lemery, and they sell quickly because they can be afforded. They could lease them for seven years, buy them, twelve-year note, whatever. And those cars, yes, go pretty fast and quick. But they're easily replaceable, you know. And that's for me. That's the one key. Fine, I can sell the car and get the money. Can I buy another one with that money? And if I can't, it's not replaceable. I'm not getting rid of the car. Now, it seems to me, most of the people that are buying exotic cars, there's, there's something special about them, aside from just being able to afford them. Is there, are there celebrities you've sold to, or who's the most famous person or uh, celebrity that you've sold a car to? Well, I've sold to multiple Seattle Seahawks players and stuff, you know, they ball players, and those are usually because, you know, that's part of their contract, they get a car, you know, so they come okay. in, you know, Marshawn Lynch would sold that white roadster he had, you know, Missy Elliott, I've sold her two cars to her, you know, cool. um, she's brilliant, you know, but there's probably, you know, half a dozen people that are pretty well known that I've sold, um, probably the most unique and most famous I would sold, I sold to a sheik in the United Arab Emirates that was was buying a car. I had a white Lamborghini Roadster. It was a one of one, and it was the early LP640 Roadster manual. And he was getting married, and his wife wanted it. And they flew. They flew privately, and they looked at the car. And then I'm not kidding. Paid cash, got it done, and put it on a FedEx transport plane. The next day, flew it to Dubai at twenty seven thousand dollars. It's insane. Wow. Yeah. And they had to come in privately. We had, they had security there. We had to close. Nobody else was supposed to see, you know, and they blocked the road for them. And it was like a presidential thing. It was pretty amazing. That's, that's an amazing part of your business, yeah, that yeah. Uh, just the clientele. I mean, you've got kids, I'm sure, that come in and want to just look, or kids. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, that just want to look at what's in the showroom. But then the clientele is fairly exclusive yeah. um, all the time in some yeah. way or another. Yeah, it's pretty unique. It's a lot of fun. Cool. Well, let's bring in Ben and let's talk about what it took to create this video. Um, I'm so mad at you for selling that cheetah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the first question here is, how did you guys meet? Oh man, long time ago. Yeah. Uh, I've been here since 2001, and as a car guy, I quickly got immersed into the car community and culture here, and um, I just started getting along with Roy right off the bat. Uh, very similar. You've heard a lot about his philosophy on collecting and, and drive what you have, and um, it's always resonated with me. Um, and we've had a lot of good times together on the roads and done rallies together, um, and he's always very gracious whenever I ask him to do something like this. So he was a, a an, wasn't an easy ask. <laughs> Depends on uh, whether he's had um, his morning yoga session. Um, but uh, yeah, it was very generous of him to. He's just a very generous guy with his cars, and and I feel like that's those are the kind of people I want to surround myself with. So has he helped drive? Your passion for cars, a mentor in some yeah, ways? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's when you surround yourself with people who are um, further along in their careers and their lives and their collecting habits. Um, Older? It, it, just further along. Only a year or two. <laughs> um, then, and they're a guy who, again, I think it's about how his message resonated with me. Like, I, I've never been a guy who buys stuff to let sit around or collect in value, and I've probably lost more money in cars than I have. Oh, yeah. money. Um, I think so, we both have. Um, and but you have the fun along the way. Yeah. And, I mean, that's, that's part of the investment, right? You're, somehow you're paying for that, and so right. if you lose some money on, a, on the sale of a car, right. I can always look back and say, well, I did this in that car, right. and how could I put a price it's, it's on It's the that? experience. It's, it's the experience. I've said, and I believe it's on the video, and one of my favorite taglines, if you're looking to make money on a car and invest, don't buy gold or, or statues or artwork. Don't buy a car. Because you know? you're re just renting time and space. You're renting time and space. Yeah, That's all that it is. I love that line. Fee. Yeah. 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 you got to do it out of the passion. Now, when you were considering cars or, or different vehicles to feature in the Along for the Ride series, what drew you to the Saline S7 Twin Turbo and Roy? 
Um, we wanted to give the audience like a really wide smattering of cars. So the Grand Wagoneer, the 037 Stradale, and the S7 just came together as this package of like, you know, someone's gonna like one of each or, 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 or one of the group. Um, and uh, I think that there's, I, I'm a fan of that era of cars between 2004 and, and 2007. I think some, some crazy cars came out. Um, and um, he had got it, it was probably six months new to him. And he's not a very showy guy, like he'll go and show, uh, bring the car to shows and stuff, but he's not out there on Instagram blasting pictures of the Celine. So not a lot of people had kind of learned that it was in his um, collection and he wasn't actively trying to sell it. So I just thought um, this is a great opportunity for, I knew he's very generous with his time, given it enough notice. Um, and I knew that if we kept it close to our Seattle you know, stomping grounds that we could do it very efficiently and we could cruise the roads. He would know where I needed him and different, you know, landmarks and stuff like that. And he would be able to just digest the whole shoot and, and be able to give me a quick yes or no. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, and it all worked out pretty well, I thought. It was a great day. It was a fun, fun day yeah, to yeah. go see the Seattle sights. Yeah. And now that video was probably closest when I when met initially. And you're talking, you know, what kind of video do you want to make? This was the closest example of what I had explained to you, that you know, let, being in a great car, seeing some of the Seattle sites, the hammering man in the background, Pike's Place Market, some of these things, how much of that played into the way that it actually ended up? Yeah, there was, it was um, kind of like iconography about it. So the car, e even though a lot of people don't know about the car, the car is very, Iconic. It's got a tremendous presence to it, and it re it reminds me of a, a almost a landmark. It's got so much mass to it, visual weight, and so I, things like the Hammering Man. Um, Hammering Man was your idea. The the Alki Beach, um, the Golden Garden stuff. There were just the uh, it, there were like the landmarks that made Seattle Seattle. There was uh, the idea of going out to the beach with with the seagulls and the gullwing doors and. Um, we've shot Seattle a lot, so many times, so we know where we can get in and out of, um, sometimes with permits, sometimes without permits, and we knew we could, um, you know, shoot the tunnel. Uh, we the, the viaduct R.I.P. was always a great place to shoot rolling shots, um, and also knowing. Roy knowing how to drive for a camera, because we've done this before and he's done it for other people, it's easy to navigate through rolling traffic and still get the shots you need. And that leads right into my next question. I got to ride with Roy in the S7 as we were essentially driving from Linwood into downtown Seattle. There's always traffic here. We're on radios communicating with you in the camera car. And I had really no idea of how complex that is and how difficult it is to come together. Uh, you've done this a bunch. How did this shoot compare to others as far as how it, how easily it came together and what were some of the challenges we ran into? I mean, we had, uh, it, I would say it was average. I mean, luckily, again, the, the ability to go back to the car and get pickups and stuff like that after was needed here. We needed to go back to the dealership. Um, but again, he's a fixed entity, we just had to give him a couple of days notice and he made the car available for us for a day of pickups. Um, so I, I think as far as, uh, you know, we had technical issues that caused a little bit of a delay, we, but I, I think all in all it came together pretty, um, pretty quickly. I like the idea of also treating it as a, it's got to feel like a normal day. We all sat down and had lunch. It was That's free spud. to me. That helped a lot. I got a <laughs> yeah. free lunch, so I was really happy. You that. did. As long as he gets Spuds, free lunch. fish, and chips, man. It was <laughs> yeah. great. And, and yeah. another, another Seattle yeah. icon. Yeah. And I remember we were sitting at the, at the table there eating our food, and uh, your cameraman came up and filmed us a little bit while we were eating our fish and chips, and I was like, oh, that's going to be a great shot. But, of course, that didn't make the cut because no. it's really all about the yeah. car. We yeah. were there just as, you know, they're enjoying it yeah. uh, in different ways. I think there's there's one aspect that we wish we had more of. We were relegated to GoPros on the inside of the car a little bit, uh, you know. But it's such a tight cab in there. There's a, a you know 
the ability to go and get ride along stuff with the larger camera would have been nice, but it would have been know, a close up of my face the whole time. And you can't get everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a look at some of the BTS photos yeah, uh, that we got. I think there's a few of there. They're just amazing photos. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah. we didn't have we we were so um, we were so intent on getting the action that when we didn't have a BTS photographer, so there isn't much for this one. Um, but, but each we have shot some amazing, makes up for We have it. some amazing so rolling for an shots. Guy, sorry, but what's the BTS mean? behind the scenes? Behind the scenes, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Behind the scenes, <laughs> a little fancy work. <laughs> just to, just to give people an idea of what it was like okay, on the day. What did GTO stand for? Pontiac GTO. Gran Turismo Omologado. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I do know some things. Um, so tell us about this photo. Do you remember where this was yeah, was this taken? What the backdrop South. is? Um, we're uh, we're just approaching downtown, I think. Um, and you know, when you have those open lines, when he's coming between cars, and you just have, you know, moments like this, you you just know that the rolling footage. Okay, got it. Like that. Those are just the iconic photos that. Uh, you get a sense of how big that car is, even though there's nothing behind it. Yeah, and the sense of motion captured there is yeah. awesome. Let's go to the next one. Um, another rolling shot approaching downtown, I think, just more trees in it. Um, seeing you guys in it, trying to figure out, uh, you know, our, it, you can't see into the cab, really, because obviously we were in uh, the Touareg, a bit of an elevated position, so can't, like, I hope Roy's not you know, being mean to this guy. But <laughs> oh, when we, we, and we were mic'd up too, but... Uh, right. Yeah, so you, this, you could, he, you could yeah, hear us, and yeah, then we yeah. had the radios as well. Yeah. No, Roy was, Roy was yeah, awesome. You got a it sense of so the, fun. You got a sense of the... That the, car doesn't have the eject button. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing for yeah. me. <laughs> of, of what it's like to control car to car over the radios, right? You got a little bit of a sense of what it was like directing you in between lanes and yeah. speed up and slow down, and now we're getting in front of you and in back of you and all that totally stuff. Totally my first experience. And then to see what the other traffic is doing, you know, because one, they're seeing this amazing car, and then the Touareg with the, the black arm right. on it. That's not something you see every day. I mean, when you see that, you're like, wow, what are they doing? Yeah. You know, what, are they, what is it they're filming? And most people, they see the saline. They have no idea what that is. They think they've seen something that they might never see again or doesn't even exist yet. Yeah. You know, it's funny, just uh, you, you, you get on a topic right there that's dear to my heart, especially at night. And I don't think people know, but they get up by the cars and they got these cameras now, your camera phones, mm -hmm. and the flash goes off when I'm trying to drive. And I appreciate they want to take pictures of the car. But I don't think they realize how unsafe that is or they get next to you and do it. You know, you leave it for a professional or come up to the gas station and ask me, can I take a picture? Take all the pictures you want. Follow but you I, home. Follow me home. You know, that's <laughs> fine. You know, I probably won't go into my driveway, but you know, but yeah, that's, you know, do it, do it a better way. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's uh, take a look at the, the, the last few shots there. Yeah, um, I think just a container enough, truck next to us there. Another shot of you passing a container truck. I think you look at these. I'm not going to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if that no. if that's the end result, I, yeah. I would I would love to take ownership of and that. Then I think we've got one with our rig in it. Um, yeah, oh, so we've got a little cool. bit of a. That was when you guys were parked over at Alki. We uh, right before the mass of people came in, we were able to get a couple of shots of the of our gear with the the car in the background. Um, but that car got flooded pretty quickly. I mean, within minutes of being parked, there was five people around it. Yeah, was, is that the last one? Oh, there's one more with the black arm yeah. in it. Yeah, and um, I think that was your first time driving for this. Yeah. Uh, pretty cool, probably, for you to watch, too, the thing bouncing around. And, that was amazing. And, and not bouncing around. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was the whole experience, you know, working with you on this whole project. This is the final episode of Along for the Ride. Uh, hopefully, we, it gets the response that uh, that I feel, you know, that this is awesome, and it was great working with Thanks, you on man. this. It was just everything we did was a new and yeah. incredible experience. I, I just love to hear if, if the audience likes this kind of storytelling from the g cars within the game, you know, speak up, people. Speak Does the up. game have a center yet? The the Senna is the cover car for Forza oh, Horizon let's do Four. So with my Senna, I'm ready. Okay. Free lunch at Buds, though. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I am totally down. We'll take you up on that. Um, when we talk about the the shoot of the day, what was your favorite moment of the day? Um, there was the, the ending shot where you guys were at uh, out at uh, the beach and sitting on a bench. Um, that was. Really great. It, we were we were flying the drone and bringing it up from the from the water height, uh, from the water line and up to reveal you on the bench. And 
beautiful bluebird day on Golden Gardens. And there was boats on the water, and you guys were just kicking back on the bench. Um, and uh, I think that was a moment where I just really enjoyed Seattle. I enjoyed um, you know having uh, a, a friend like you who would do something like that for me, and um, it was a good time. And that's where I started my drag racing career. Yeah, at Golden Gardens. Gardens. Yeah, when we were 18 in high school, you used drag race cars up and down. Golden oh, really? Right. Oh, yeah. Show, show drive there. Oh, yeah. Huh. That's awesome. That's great. Full circle. Now, the viaduct's gone now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. Have you, if, if you had done, you've probably done some other filming there, but there, this film will now be, have nostalgia in other ways. People yeah. might watch this movie just to see what the viaduct yeah. looked Many like. Many of our videos have the viaduct. It was such a lovely place to shoot. Do you think the, the new tunnel provides a, an opportunity to, to shoot things? Yeah. I've driven it through a couple We've times. already shot in there. I think it's different. It's, never, it's not going to be the same. you you got no skyline, so it's not the same. Yeah, it was something that you just don't see in many yeah. cities. You can't combine that yeah. placement of a highway with the waterfront and downtown. And downtown's so different now. With there's just not this barrier there. Right. I don't know if it's better because I'm not used to it, and change is difficult. But <laughs> right. but the new tunnel is it is this neat thing, and yeah. certainly seems like the way it should have been done originally, so that downtown all came together. But yeah. kind of neat thing. Um, Roy, I think it's time to put you in the passenger seat, and I do have an actual Lamborghini seat here for you, <laughs> so you should feel fairly comfortable. <laughs> and I'll take you for a ride in your nice. car. Nice. Without the risk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if that's all right. If you want to plop in the uh, Lamborghini seat there on the other it's side, like I'll, uh, I'll hop in and we'll drive the Saline S7 in Forza Motorsport 7. Put my notes down here. All right. This is the way we've been ending these shows. It's just a great way to tie. Where's my seatbelt? <laughs> oh, you don't need it. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're good. Click it or tick it. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll flip over to gameplay mode here. We'll get this thing started up. And I think I'm going to be driving at Laguna Seca. That's my uh, color, too. Yeah. That's your color. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if the, I think the tune I actually have on this car is a twin turbo tune. The car that's in our game is just, is just the And the S7. way you'd always tell the twin turbo, see where the S7 is on the back? Yeah. The twin turbos will have a TT right behind it. Only the TTs have that. That's how to identify the car. Otherwise, they're identical. Now, of course, in the motorsport game, in the sports game, you can tune the car however yeah. you want. You can put twin turbos on it, supercharge or whatever. And I think what I've done with this car is build it to be similar in horsepower with twin turbos. I drove for the show before this was a Honda Civic front wheel drive. Yeah. Uh, maybe it had 250 horsepower. Boy, that so, was a fast car, wasn't it? You know, for its car, it is. I mean, it's so lightweight and little. Yeah, and, and way more predictable. I mean, for yeah. front wheel drive, there's you know what's happening more. Whereas this car will ride on rails until it decides to to bite you. So I'm going to try to make the first few laps here not ugly. And they should hopefully get better lap by lap, maybe even faster. Bring the next wheel a little bit smoother. Have you driven any of your cars at Laguna Seca? No, I have not. You go down there for Mont Yeah, for a I've driven it. I've driven up. Okay, okay yeah, that's why I don't give you the keys to my car. <laughs> um, but I've driven out at Fortuna, you know, the California Speedway several times. I like that. Okay. You know. There's not really a lot around the Seattle area here. Some good tracks down Portland Murder National Raceway, that's pretty nice. Been on that track there a couple of times. Of course, it is. This car is so big. I mean, even in Forza, you, you can still feel how big it is. Yeah. I'm going to rumble with that 427 behind us. I'm trying to get a little more conservative, get the, get the feel for it. But when you put your foot in it, even at 60 miles an hour in third gear, it's still ready to just totally. Yeah. I haven't spun it yet, so I'll, I'll say that that's a good thing. First lap. I was looking for that telephone pole over there. Oh, there it's going to get ugly. Should, I should not talk. That's what I oh, do. that's the excuse you're going with? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, I've got a bucket. Yeah, that works. <laughs> I've okay. got so many excuses. Yeah. I thought you were going to say the helicopter bothered you. See, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to 
because when you come up over that point down the street where there's a telephone pole, then that's supposed to be your focus point uh, as you come over so you're not actually trying to so you thread right through there. Look at all the cameras going off, you're famous. <laughs> They've seen me screw up a couple yeah. times, they're just trying to catch that moment where I total a safety S7. Well, as long as you weren't hurt, that'd be okay because the value would go up on mine. <laughs> Those gears are so long. You know, while you're driving, kind of a neat, unique thing that if anybody ever got the Saline S7, the stick shift, it actually turns back and forth a little bit, enough so your wrist when you're going through the corner so it's not a stiff gift shift. Huh. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. It's pretty unique. And when I talked to Steve Saley, that's when they built into it on purpose because certain corners, you know where your wrist was going if you're shifting gears. That way you, your wrist is moving with the gear pad. Everybody that's watching is just like, oh my God, why did they let that guy drive? No wonder he was racing and driving. One thing that's, that's, that's hard about, about Forts, I mean, you get, a, you get a lot of the look and feel and the physics are, are all there and the great selection of cars, but the risk, you know, yeah. just doesn't exist in the same way. This car is, is so fast that uh, Yeah. Okay. You're missing the apex, by the way. <laughs> the car, it's, it's, it's so fast that I've got a, I have a hard time getting into the, uh, you know, figuring out where the breaking point is. I'm too busy listening to how awesome it sounds. So we'll finish up this lap, and as we come across the finish line, we will call that the end of the show and uh, get Ben to come sit over here and give you guys a thank you as we wrap up this final episode of the Walk of the Ride. The sound is just so Oh, yeah, that's insane. And the rest of this will last lap. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to impress you. Are you impressed? No. <laughs> <laughs> Because I plan on doing this on the 405 on the way home. Uh, Except mine's going to have three digits. You only get two. Oh, once in a while you get three digits. It feels. I mean, you can, I, I know it's just it, it's a video game, but I can, I can feel the speed. Oh, yeah. It is an amazing machine. Feel how tightly packed we are in that cockpit. I'm a little more concerned There's an addiction to just punch it. You're a better passenger than I thought you'd be. Yeah. Oh. I had my phone, I'd be dialing 911 right now. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Cross the line. We'll do three of our four laps. And then we'll just park the car right here in front of the mouse. That's a good safe place. Just, just walk away slowly. Yeah, that's all right. At the rise, next car behind you can hit it. Do you see gloves like that? <laughs> no. <laughs> My hands are sculpted nice as they are. <laughs> well, let's go back to a full screen and do our outro here. This has been episode six of Along for the Ride, featuring the 2005 Saline S7 Twin Turbo with guest Roy Katz. Thank you. Thank you, you sir. It's fun. Ben, thank you. Thanks, buddy. This is, this it was fun. <laughs> Blast. Thanks, buddy. This and that's spelled C A T S because they always spell it wrong. Put a Z in it? Yeah, Z at the end or a K at the front. No. C A T S, just like you were taught in first grade. Cats, like me, meow, meow. Just like you would think. Um, this is how we end the show, and I think you'll get it. I'm John Iwana. I'm Roy Katz. I'm Ben. And you're not. We are out of here. Thanks for watching.